But I think that is a wrong approach. The best approach is to use uh, proceeds or income from those resources and begin to transition towards a lower carbon economy. Because even studies show that for countries that are rich in oil and gas, um, such as even the United Kingdom, oil and gas is not going to be there forever. You know, it's, it's going to finish at some point. So why don't you use the money you're getting from that resource and begin to invest in less polluting industries? That's like something I've been emphasizing. There is, um, you know, there's also the need um, to um, work on technology transfer, technology transfer number one and technology absorption. Because the problem in many developing countries is that even if, you, if, even if the government decides that, oh, yes, we're going to protect the environment, we're going to pollute less, there's simply no technology, right? You know, so most of the time you say, well, we want to do it, but there's really no technology. And my response has always been, whenever you have those discussions that Professor Gary was talking about in terms of cooperation, why don't you put technology transfer as priority? Why don't you say, well, we want technology transfer. We want cleaner technologies that will save the environment. That's number one. I've also, talk, I've also been talking a lot about the need for homegrown solutions. You know, um, when we talk of technology, we always think about the big ones. So oh, aviation technology or the clean machines and clean engines. But there are smaller solutions. Um, and in, in, some, in Rwanda, even in Kenya, you've seen increased adoption of things like uh, clean stoves, clean cooking stoves, you know, which, you know, very small, anyone can, you know, very easy to make and very easy to use, but will save the environment. So I always encourage the need for developing countries to think about homegrown solutions, no matter how small, um, that will help them achieve better environmental outcomes. And I think that leads me to, um, yeah, so, so I think that, that answers that, the question about, you know, balancing environmental prosperity um, with, envir uh, sorry, economic prosperity with environmental goals. I think whatever prosperity we get from polluting industries, we must realize that they are short term, they will not last forever, and we must begin to use them to support cleaner industries. And this COVID provides an opportunity for that. You, you see that in Canada recently, the prime minister did something that a lot of people were angry about. But instead of sending money to Alberta to save the oil and gas industry, he decided to send money to Alberta, but for cleanups, for, for environmental cleanup. Even though people were angry about that, you know, that oh, is not saving the oil and gas industry. I think it's a good idea, you know, using resources for um, much more sustainable um, ideas rather than um, spending um, our little resources on things that will not, you know, be sustainable in the long run. And I think that, uh, that goes to Reima's uh, question as well. Um, in the context of Kenya, of course, Kenya is one of those countries that was just beginning to say, yes, it's our time to produce oil and gas. They, they just uh, lifted the first uh, crude last year and they shipped it and everybody was happy that, yes, Kenya has joined the big league of oil producing countries. But now the, the, uh, the uh, COVID-19 happened oil, a barrel of oil is now cheaper than a bottle of water, you know, and so no one is really keen or interested in, in oil and gas. So what can uh, a country like that do? I think the, the solution is economic diversification, you know, sort of uh, diversifying into other things. Um, again, we've mentioned that there is a, a sense in doing that anyway, because no matter how much you like oil and gas, it will not be there forever. So there is a need to then begin to diversify and be known for something else. For example, agriculture is there. You know, um, there are also a number of um, solid minerals in Kenya if, that if, for example, Kenya is very rich in gold, um, you know, which if well managed and well used can lead to much more sustainable outcomes. So I think economic diversification is very key. And, and also there is a need to begin to integrate this idea of a green economy. Um, you know, a green economy is what we've been talking about, which is let us see these old environmental issues not as a threat, but as an opportunity for economic growth. So let the government invest the resources that are available to create green jobs, green sectors, you know, using environmental challenges as, as, as a platform for, for growth. And I think that's what Kenya can do. Thanks. Yes. Um, thank you very much.
Um, we have two final questions. Um, I have Amma and Amma, do you like to unmute? Amar, would you like us to read your question out or can you unmute? Okay. Us to read it? Okay, Cassie, why don't you go ahead while we find it and then we'll read it out. Yeah, for sure. Um, hi, everybody. I, I'm from Canada and I feel like, uh, as I, probably most people know, Canada is heavily, heavily reliant on our economy for oil. And I feel like at this point of time, we have about a third of the country that's like, please divest from oil with anything that, like, anything that we can. But there's still like the majority of the population is very in favor of investing in oil. So just going off of the previous conversations, how, do, how, how can we help transition our economy away from these, these staples and um, heavily environmentally unfriendly commodities when it's not really politically viable? Thank you very much um, for the question. We have found the question. Uh, what the best impact on the environment among people lead to the action by government in countries? Wow. Okay, we will first go to um, Professor Gary and then Luana and then Luana um, and then Andrea and then Andrea for any closing um, any closing answers. Yes. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, fascinating uh, questions and discussions. Uh, I think um, uh, the, the, the transition to uh, a green or definitely a different kind of economy is inevitable now. Um, and uh, in a way, we have an opportunity here to, to shape how we want our future to look like, the, the future we want. That's the promise of the Sustainable Development Goals. So highlighting uh, that we need to achieve those goals in, uh, in only just 10 years to come is uh, going to be a huge task for, for all. And I would argue that uh, only different kind of uh, and different types of economic activities can actually achieve those uh, Sustainable Development Goals. Um, and then it's up to all of you on this Zoom call to shape uh, the future in a way that uh, you want with clean water and clean air and lots of biodiversity and less of a climate uh, carbon restrained world. Thank you. Um, and now we will go to Luana and then um, Sandria Wilson, which is um, for closing remarks. Um, I'm not actually sure if I can answer any questions. <laughs> you think that we can pressure governments into changing their mind like Umar was suggesting? Possibly. But, like, I think in terms of the UK, we managed to get the council to declare a climate emergency, but they haven't really managed to do anything on it. So pressuring them to say something and to do something are two different things that don't always correlate into things actually happening. Okay, thank you. And now, Andrea, before um, we close, um, I mean, sorry, um, I forgot someone. Andrea and Nola for closing remarks. Uh, so I would just like to say that uh, I think that as like a society, I think we have all the resources, we have all the solutions to fix the problems we have created. Basically, we just need to kind of come together and like, implement them and use what we have created and i think that it is kind of i think it's possible to pressure government into doing things um but i do think it requires a big movement and many people participating so i think 
the best thing that like us individually can do is kind of just educate other people and invite them to join uh, the movement of climate action. Okay, and then to Professor Dami Lola. Yes, thank you so much. Um, Nico, it's, it's been um, wonderful. And I think I'll quickly take on the question about Canada, um, given that I, I spent a lot of my years in, the, in Alberta, where you know, the epicenter of, uh, of, of oil and gas, uh, where I was practicing law for some time. Um, the thing is that there is um, anything that has to do with change is not easy especially when, you know, I mean, when I was in Alberta, the entire province depends so much on oil and gas. It's, it's you know, and of course, um, money coming out of Alberta is very critical to the economy of Canada as a whole, you know. Um, so it's, it's def therefore not easy to say that the entire province should shut down and just stop using oil and gas. Um, so I think that is, that is, that is uh, where the challenge always comes, in which, you know, but I think, I think from my talk with people, you realize that everyone knows that, you know, you cannot continue to uh, depend on one industry, as a matter of fact, especially with the pollution associated with it. And that is where the idea comes of, you know, uh, having a transition plan. And, and that's what I see that is already happening. Um, just last week, yeah, you know, there, there was a huge uh, celebration in Calgary that uh, I think the the, uh, the, the, the signpost that you see when you go into Calgary says uh, be part of the energy and now so I think maybe the city decided to change that signpost to be part of the energy transition. So there is, um, there is that growing awareness that we now need to create alternate economies and, and I think what um, the government is doing now, what everyone is talking about in Alberta is the need to use resources and income from oil and gas to create other sectors, number one. Number two, to take advantage of this current slowdown in the oil and gas industry, to be creative. So if before now we all thought oil and gas was our only savior, now we all realize that it is such a volatile commodity. It, you know, it's not even uh, lucrative right now. So why can't we use this current slowdown to create other ventures? And I think um, that, that is where uh, you know, some of those politically charged issues might be addressed right now. This is a good opportunity, it's a, it's a good uh, time, you know, because everyone knows that the oil and gas business is not doing well right now. So we can easily mobilize um, towards creating other viable industries. And I hope that we'll continue those uh, discussions and we'll begin to see the, 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 the diversification of the economy in Canada to, you know, to become reliant on other things. Alberta has other things, it's not just oil, but I think this slowdown will help us to tap into those other things. Brilliant. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, it, it gives me great sadness. It, it falls to me on behalf of the Eco Council and the Voices of Future Generations to thank all these amazing speakers and also all of you as faithful, active and fascinating um, participants um, and also the collaborators. Um, Annie, Adette, Sarah, and Cassie, um, as who have joined and inspired us over the last three months, five eco seminars since lockdown started. But we may host another eco seminar again. Thank you very much, and I hope to see you all soon.